Church say amen once again. Amen. It's indeed uh, a blessing again that God has given us to come out and hear another portion of his word. We'll be mindful of uh, the ones that are not here. I want to continue to pray for them. I want to thank God for getting us through this blizzard, or not blizzard, but what do you call it, uh, Arctic freeze or whatever. Turning us back with a reasonable amount of health that we may be able to do his will in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable to him. This morning, I'd like to wish those well being, the ones that may be watching this video or watching this from uh, Facebook. Or whatever other means, I want to thank them for bearing and hopefully something maybe say it that'll help um, help us to get our lives right and get in the good favor of God. Because sometimes we believe we are in the good favor of God, but we're not. At this time, I'm going to go to the scripture reading and read it once again. This time, I would like to read one extra scripture to help get us some context and draw a title. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 12 through 16 is where we'll try to get our context from. And it reads, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 12 through 16, it says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was uh, before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all on suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now, if you would turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, 1 through 6. I like to use uh, this passage of scripture to draw a title for this lesson. Acts chapter 9. And it's verses 1 through 6. And it reads, And Saul, yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, What art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom Thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the prince. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. This morning I like to use for 
subject, what shall I do? That's what shall I do? Since my childhood days, as far back as I could remember, I have always watched or observed others. My goal was to learn a specific thing. It may have been to learn what I need to do in order to fix my car, or fix a flat, or build a house, or build storage sheds. Each time, there was a pattern or example that I needed, or that needed to be followed. If I wanted to get a certain result out of whatever I was doing, I needed to follow the pattern. See, for something to turn out right, you can't do it wrong and expect to get right results. See, after I bought my car, I went out and bought me the repair uh, manual book so that I can fix the problems as they occur. The repair book will show you the pattern or the example of how to make something right when it comes to your automobile. But when it comes to making things right in our lives, then we need to use another book. And that book is the book of books, the Holy Bible. Because it will show us the pattern or example on how to become a true child of God. The word pattern means a model or original used as an archetype. And an, what an archetype is, an archetype is a very typical example of a certain person or thing. There's another definition. It says a, 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 a pattern is a person or thing considered worthy of imitation. First Corinthians 11 and verse 1, Paul says, Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. And there's a third. It says a pattern is a plan, diagram, or model to be followed in making things. See, in order to keep this lesson in its proper context, we need to use the proper meaning for the word pattern. And I want to use uh, the latter meaning that I gave, a plan, diagram, or model to be followed in making things. Today the pattern I want to talk about is the plan of salvation. The pattern that the word of God says for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. See, this uh, is the pattern that is used to make a child of God a true Christian. As we look at this pattern in great detail, we are going to have to put it to the test. And what I mean by that, we are going to have to uh, do some contrast, and we're going to con be contrast it or, or compare it to another so-called pattern or example that some say is the example that is used when it comes to someone being saved. See, this pattern is the one that we hear about so much in religion today, and it is called being saved like the thief on the cross. I know you all have heard that, or maybe some of you have used that. It's being saved like the thief on the cross. See, today I want to share a few points with you as to why the false doctrine of being saved like the thief on the cross is not applicable to Christians today. I want to show why they, most commonly our Baptist friends and others, Choose the thief on the cross to be used as the doctrine on how 
to be saved. I would also like to show you the pattern that is supposed to be uh, used today in order for us to be saved. Here we find in the scripture reading, this is Apostles, Apostle Paul's first epistle or letter to Timothy. We find Paul in this letter to Timothy giving thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the mercy that he has shown him. Paul is giving thanks to Jesus for putting him in the ministry. See, we know that Paul was not always a nice guy. And he was not always in the ministry. Look at verse number 13 of the scripture reading. 1 Timothy uh, 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 1, 12 through 16, number, verse number 13. It says that he was a blasphemer. Blasphemer is... Is one who speaks of God in an irrelevant, impious manner. It says that he was a persecutor. In Galatians 1, in verse 13, it says that Paul persecuted the church of God and wasted it. It says that Paul was injurious. Don't nobody know what that means. Yeah, that means he used to hurt folks. It says that Paul was the chief of sinners. Now, even though Paul was this horrible person, the Bible says he obtained mercy. The Bible says because he did it ignorantly in belief, in unbelief, excuse me, Paul thought what he was doing was right. Just like many out there in the denominational world today. A lot of folk think they're doing the right thing. See, the Bible says he even went to the high priest for permission to go out and put Christians in prison. See, that was, that's what he was doing when he was on that road <clears throat> to Damascus. Now look at verse number 16. Verse number 16 in our scripture reading. It says, once I get there, verse number 16. How be it? For this cause, I obtain mercy, that in me first, notice what he said, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering. He was long-suffering when Paul did something special for him. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. The Bible said Paul is going to be a pattern. And then the, the rest of that verse, it says a pattern and tells you who. It said to them, which should hereafter, that means later, believe on him to life everlasting. Paul is the pattern. <clears throat> See, what is being said here is that Jesus is allowing what happened to Paul to be a pattern for all of us to follow. See, when we look at the New Testament scriptures, we find Saul, or Paul's conversion, not one, but three different times in the Bible. That's more than any other conversion in the Bible. We find it in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26. Today, I want to focus on the account of Paul's conversion found in Acts chapter 22. Turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 22. We're going to take a look at it. 
and summarize it up a little bit. Acts chapter 22, 1 through 16. Bible said, men. <clears throat> It says, men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense. See, Paul is giving a defense which I make now unto you. See, Paul has is going on trial and he's giving a defense, letting them know, letting uh, King Agrippa and whoever uh, uh, know that uh, he was once a uh, uh, for he is a Jew born in Tarsus, in a city in Sicily. He was brought up under one of the heavy hitters, or one of the teachers, uh, uh, Gabriel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of his fathers. See, Paul was taught the law. He was living under the law. You know, and Paul says that uh, he persecuted uh, this way, or Christ's church. He said he bind them, bounded them up, and delivered them into prison, men and women. See, I told you Paul wasn't that nice of a guy. Say he, uh, uh, the high priest does bear witness. He said he got, Paul got witnesses of the lifestyle he lived. I wonder if we have witnesses of our lifestyle that we live. See, Paul wasn't so good. Verse 5 says, and all the state of the elders, saying that they witnesses from whom also he received letters unto the brethren and went to Damascus to bring them which were bound unto Jerusalem to be punished because they was following the will of God. And they didn't, Paul said he did all this in ignorant and un belief. And he says that it came to pass that he was on his way down the road to uh, Damascus and he fell to the ground. He heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said he answered and asked who it was and it was Lord. He said, who are you thou, Lord? He told him, he said, I'm Jesus. I'm the one that you persecute." Then Paul realized what was going on. He's blind. And the Bible said, they that were with him saw indeed the light. See, we got a lot of folk out here having these, uh, 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 these encounters with God all by themselves. Well, God told me to do this and that. Look at what Paul, the other folks saw the light. And were afraid. But they did not hear the voice that spoke to him. And the Bible says, Paul asked him, said, Lord, he said, he said, what shall I do? Paul wanted to know what did Jesus want him to do? Paul wanted instructions and Jesus gave them to him. The Bible said, the Lord said unto him, arise and go into Damascus. And, it, uh, and, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. Paul found out what he needed to do. Now remember, Paul is the pattern. He found out what he needed to do. He needed to go to see somebody. And they would tell him what to do. He was to go and see one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. Came unto me and stood and said uh, unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And at the same hour I looked upon, looked up upon him, Paul said. There are a lot of folks out here, healing folks. Telling folk, God, oh, well, yeah, get six months. So the same hour he was able to see. And he said, God of the fathers has chosen thee that thou. This is Ananias talking to him, telling him what he's going to do, that thou shouldest know his will, know God's will, and see that 
see that just one and should hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Call them on the name of the Lord. You know, a lot of folk don't want to hear that. Uh, what was told to Paul as an example to us. See, during this account of Paul's conversion, there is no doubt about the importance of baptism. We can read it right here. Uh, uh, what are you waiting for? It says, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. See, without it, there is no remission of sin. See, I don't know about you, but I'm going to put my trust in Jesus, just like Paul did. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it said, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all men that obey him. See, everybody want to go to heaven, but don't nobody want to obey, obey Jesus. Ain't that something? It says, Christ is the author of eternal salvation, and there are some folks that would rather listen to John Smythe, Charles Harrison Mason, and John Kevin, and there are many others. And you know what they all have in common? They are dead. You're listening to the wrong person. You need to listen to somebody that's alive. Jesus is alive and on, sitting on his throne. And he left us a plan to follow. But we don't want to do it. See, the false doctrine of uh, being saved, like the thief on the cross says, that you don't have to be baptized. But 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Timothy 1, 16 says that what Apostle Paul did to be saved would be the pattern in which we are all to follow. Acts 16, excuse me, Acts 22, 16, says that Ananias told Paul, get up, it's waiting on you, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I don't know why that's so hard for folk to just uh, absorb. Now let's look. Let's look at the thief on the, on the cross as a count. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Yep, we're going to do a little bit of reading. Luke chapter 23, and hopefully the ones that are out there watching, uh, uh, turn your Bible there too. So you won't be able to say, Casey it showed me something that wasn't in the Bible. Luke. 23, 39 to 46. And it says, And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God? You know, I want to ask a bunch of folk out there right now. Folk in here too. You're not afraid of God? He says, Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done, done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou, uh, 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 today shalt thou be with me in paradise. You know, now, don't get me wrong. I didn't say that the account of the thief on the cross being saved is not important. But nowhere in the word of God does it say that the 
thief on the cross is the how to be saved. For us today. See, false teachers will have us to believe that, believe that nonsense. But the scripture does not say that. They will tell us, well, you know, the thief on the cross, uh, he didn't get baptized. Church, I have a question for the false teachers that propagate that lie. Well, anybody that believed that and passed that lie on, I have a question. Um, how do you know that the thief on the cross was not baptized? It's a very simple question. How do you know that the thief on the cross was not baptized? The scriptures don't say he was not baptized, but let's see what the Bible says. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, verse 28. And uh, through 30, it says, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Saying he's greater than John the Baptist. And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of him. See, how do you know if the thief on the cross wasn't in that bunch of folks? You don't know that. He could have been in that bunch of folks right there that got baptized. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. You don't believe that? Let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Verses 4 and 6. It says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And the same John had his remnants of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then the Bible says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Again, how do you know that the thief on the cross was not in those groups? See, we just don't know. So how can you say that the thief on the cross was not baptized when you don't know? Now, knowing this, how can you, how can they get the guts, come out the falls? Uh, uh, teachers get the guts to say that the thief on the cross doctrine is the how to be saved. Remember what it says in Hebrews 5, 8 through 9. It said Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all of them that obey him. Hebrews chapter 12 and 2 it says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. In Matthew 28 and 18 it says and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. See, it's simple. Jesus could save whoever he wanted to save while he was on the earth. But he ain't going to save you like that now. Because Jesus is in heaven now. He left us a pattern to follow. You think he was just going to leave us high and dry? Let us do what we want to do? That ain't what Jesus is going to do. See, they were still uh, living under the law of Moses when the thief was on the cross. And Jesus was not dead. Well, they said, how you know that, preacher? Because he was talking 
to the one. He spoke to him. So he wasn't dead. And he has not been buried. And he sure has not uh, rose from the grave yet. Now, after he do all these, uh, all those things, and his church come into existence, then we will, then all will have to follow the same pattern that Paul did in order to be saved. The thief on the cross doctrine is not the how to be saved, but instead, it is the who can be saved. Even a thief can be saved. It's not the how, but the who. You know, when we, we all probably had something stole from us, and we were ready to crucify, if we ever found out who did it. Y'all know that's true. Somebody done stole something I done worked hard for. I'm ready to, I'm ready to get them. But the Bible says even a thief can be saved. Let's look back at the scripture reading. 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16, it says that Paul was a blasphemer, persecutor, murderer, injurious, and the chief of the sinners. Paul was a mess, and if he could receive mercy, then what about you and me? Now I know there's some, some things in our lives that uh, we don't want nobody to know about. But I'm here to tell you, God already knows about it. How you know that preacher? Listen to the book. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse number 14, it says, For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Church, I have another question. And that question is simple. It's why. That, that question is so simple, it is why. Why use the thief on the cross to be the to show? Why baptism is not necessary for salvation. You know, they, they think they have a good reason for that. Why use the thief on the cross to anchor a false doctrine of all you must do is believe and you'll be saved? Why use the thief on the cross to mislead many souls into believing that when you are voted into their false religion or their false existence, you will be saved like the thief on the cross and once saved, always saved. See, when you start believing false stuff, you got to put some more into it. You believe the thief on the cross uh, uh, is the way to be saved, then once you're saved, you can never be lost. Folks believe that. Well, I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you why. But first, turn your Bibles to James chapter 5. I told you we'd be doing some reading here. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. See, I want to show you why once saved, always saved, don't hold water. Folks will tell you that. But let's see what the book Let's see what James says. James chapter 5, and verse 19 and 20. It says, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now, what I want to know, 
is how can someone save a soul from death when you're already saved? Once saved, always saved. You know, if you're always saved, then James chapter 5, 19 and 20 is a big fat lie. Notice what it says again. Look back at it again. James 5, 19 and 20. It says, brethren, if any of you do err from the truth. See, err from the truth means that you done messed up. You done fell off the, 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 the beaten path. See, that means you had truth. So now you done erred from truth. So that means you were saved. And if you saved, he said, one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way uh, shall save a soul. How you gonna save a soul that's already saved? So once saved, always saved is a lie. You fall off the path, you ain't saved no more. It's, it's simple. It says, if any of you do err from the truth, if you got, what the truth? Come on, y'all know what truth is. Listen to the book, John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Here's somebody who knew the truth and fell off the way. Listen to the book, John 17, 17 says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. So how are you going to try to say once saved, you always saved? You know what that does? That means you can just do anything in the world you want to. You can be a murderer, criminal, but just keep killing. See, Paul didn't continue killing. He stopped. You can just do anything and you say, see, that makes folk feel good when, when your pastor tell you that. So he ain't got to check. He ain't got to recommend you. You can live any kind of old disgusting way. And it don't matter when you believe once saved, always saved. But it's just one great big lie. Ask your pastor. Ask some folk about it. Ask questions. Now I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you why the doctrine of saved like the thief on the cross was chosen to spearhead these false religions. Somebody going to say, well, what do you mean, preacher, by false religion? I'm talking about anybody that believes that the thief on the cross is the how to be saved. You know if y'all believe that, your, your preachers and pastors and first ladies and all that stuff, they're telling you that. About anybody that believes or promotes or uh, uh, saved like the thief on the cross. See, but first, in order for me to do that, we're going to have to, I told you this earlier, compare it. We're going to compare the thief, or uh, uh, saved like the thief on the cross, to other times that Jesus saved someone. Then you're going to get it, I believe. Now, that's what the denominational world don't want you to know. But I'm going to spill the beans. That's my job. The Bible says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, the thief on the cross was not the only time that Jesus saved someone. There were other times that Jesus saved somebody. Let's take a look at it. Turn your Bibles to... Luke chapter 19, verse 1 through 9. And I'm going to have to read all that so we can understand what's going on when, it's, when you say saved like the thief on the cross. Luke chapter 19, 1 through 9, saying, Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. He was a head honcho in the tax collectors. And he was rich and he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature he's a little guy and he ran before and climbed up in a into a sycamore tree to see him for he was to pass that way 
And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Okay, you got one part of it. Zacchaeus is a sinner. Now look at what verse 8 says. And, and Zacchaeus stood and, saying, and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him four folds or four times. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house for, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now, my question. Why not use this account? Why not use this account to anchor this false religion? See, what's wrong with this account of Christ saving somebody? Why don't they call it being saved like Zarchaeus in the sycamore tree? No, but they want to say, uh, 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 instead, uh, 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 it's being saved like the thief on the cross. Why not being saved? Why don't nobody say, well, you can be saved like Zarchaeus. Don't worry, we're going uh, to show you why in just a little bit. But I want to know why not. Now turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 22. I hope y'all got your Bibles out there in uh, Facebook and wherever else. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 19, 16 through 22. I'm slowing down a little bit so you can get there so you won't miss it. The Bible says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Ain't that's what it's all about? Having eternal life in heaven? And this, uh, this, good, uh, this, this uh, one asked Jesus. And the Bible says, and he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt, he said, but if you will, uh, enter into life and keep the commandments. He said unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy uh, father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The young man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? He said, well, how, why am I falling short? What I need to do? What am I missing? And Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possession. If y'all don't know what that is, that means he had a whole lot of stuff. Now my question, now, why not use this account? See, Jesus uh, 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 told the man what to do in order to be saved. See, but nobody wants to use this account as the how to be saved. Now, Jesus told them exactly what to do, and he can have life eternal. But nobody don't want to say, let's, let's, let's be saved like the rich young ruler, what Jesus told him to do. Now, let's look at the thief on the cross, and we're about done. Let's look at the thief on the cross. 
and we can find out why it was chosen to anchor false religion as how to be saved. Turn back to Luke, chapter 23, verse 39 to 34. I'm going to read it again because it's very important. I don't know if you saw it earlier, but let's, let's see if you got it. It says, and one of the malefactors, which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deed. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus gave him an answer. Jesus said, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Verse number 42 and 43 is the key. He said, he said unto uh, 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 Jesus, Lord, remember me when I come into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today uh, uh, shall thou be with me in paradise. And that's it. Did y'all see? Okay, well, let me, let me see if I can bring it out a little bit more. Jesus didn't tell him, the, the thief on the cross, Jesus did not tell him to take half of his stuff and give it to the poor. Or to give back four folds. Four times. That means if he stole $100, he needed to give 400 back. He, he didn't tell him to give four fold what he stole from the people. Now remember, this is a thief. And thieves take things that don't belong to them. He just said, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't say go and sell what you have and give it to the poor like he said uh, 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 like he said to the rich young ruler. He just said today shall thou be with me in paradise. Notice something. All these others, other accounts required that there was something that they had to do. Zacchaeus was going to get back what he had, what he done took from somebody. The rich young ruler had to sell everything and give it to the poor and follow Jesus. There was something that they had to do. They all had to do something. You know what people always tell you when they talk about the thief on the cross. Well, all you have to do is believe. Well, Jesus told these folk that they, was going to, they had to do something. They were doing something. When he saved them or, or told them how to be saved. Now all the thief on the cross had to do was to hang on the cross and die. And that's why the Baptists and other religions go to the thief on the cross as to the how to be saved. How to be saved. Why? Because you ain't got to do nothing. Just stay there and die. And they trick so many folk to believe that something's being done here. All you got to do is die. The thief on the cross wasn't going nowhere. That's why they chose him. But Zacchaeus climbed the tree, talked to Jesus, took him home, and told him that he was going to give back all his stuff. But look what the other ones had to do. I mean, excuse me, the thief on the cross. Just stay on the cross and die. Now we got folks running around here all over the world telling folk, Oh, be saved just like the thief on the cross. That's a great big lie. And if your pastor or anybody's telling that, you need to say, hey, this is what I heard. What is your answer to this? Answer this question. Why are you telling us we can be saved like the thief on the cross? Now, do you think your pastors and all of them want to sell everything that they have and give it to the poor? Well, that's what Jesus told the rich young ruler to do. Why can't you do that? He said you're going to be saved and follow him. Do you think T.D. Jakes, Creflo Dollar, Joel Osteen, Joyce Miles, old Benny Hinn, Juanita Bynum, 
and others who propagate that false doctrine want to sell everything they got or pay restitution to all the people that they are stealing from every Sunday with the lies that they're telling them. Oh, you better get your ties right. Telling you that great big lie they're robbing you. Telling you that you're robbing God. And God wants a free will offering, nothing restraint. They are lying to you. But you know the bad part about it? You believe in it. You got the Bible right here to tell you. All you got to do is get in it. You don't think those big heavy hitters on those uh, programs are going to sell everything they got? No, they're trying to get more and tell you. Fred Price, how many cars he got and all this and yachts and stuff. He ain't scared to tell you because you're going to pay for them. He ain't afraid to lie to you either. Tell you that being saved like a thief on the cross. See, they want to be saved like the thief on the cross because the only thing that the thief on the cross had to do was nothing. Just stay there and let the air go out of his body. And that was it. There may be some here today that want to be saved. Or maybe some out there that want to be saved. Well, I'm sorry, but you can't be saved like the thief on the cross. Because that is not the how to be saved, but the who can be saved. And if you're out there and you're within this, this area, 1414 West Locust, Davenport Island. If you're out there and you want to uh, answer a question, 563-554-9407. We can talk about this thief on the cross. But now the Church of Christ is not afraid to tell you the truth. And I know you probably have a church of Christ in your area. The thief on the cross didn't have nothing to do. I think that's something. Nothing to do in order to be saved. He didn't have to run out there and get rid of his money. But for those that want to be saved, see in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, Paul says to Jesus, and, uh, uh, um, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. See, that's the pattern. It's going to be told to you what to do by using the word of God. God correctly. Now I'm going to tell you what you must do in order to be saved. I'm going to tell you. See, first you must hear the word. You must hear that Jesus died and was buried and rose again the third day. So you want to hear some more, you want to hear about that. See, that's that's a fact of the gospel, but there's other facts of the gospel. That Jesus, the Bible said, he purchased the church of God with his blood. So you're going to need to know what church you need to be in, too. Ephesians 4 and 4, uh, 4 and verse 5 said there's one body. Ephesians 1 and 18, and um, I believe 120, uh, 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 Colossians 118 and uh, Ephesians 1 22 to 23 uh, I believe it says the body is the church and it says the church is the body so Jesus purchased his church with his blood you need to hear that Romans 10 17 so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God then you must believe what you've heard, that Jesus died and was buried and rose the third day. Romans 10 and 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then you must repent. Luke 13, 3, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. 
And then you must confess Jesus be the Son of God. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. And then, this is the thing that the thief on the cross want to keep you away from. All oh, them passing oh, it ain't important. Let's see if it's important. It's in the Bible. Let's see. And then you must be baptized for the remission of your sin. Remember, Paul is the pattern. Acts 22, 16. Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sin, calling on the name of the Lord. That is Ananias talking to Paul, telling him to get up and be baptized. Paul was a Jew. Paul had to change his religion to be saved. Paul became a member of the Church of Christ. And that's what you have to do. Now you might have some folk been telling you all these years that you don't. Follow your mom and your grandma. I had somebody tell me, well, you mean to tell me my grandma ain't going to be saved? My, uh, 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 this and that and all these kid folk ain't going to, ain't, ain't he so and so ain't going to be saved? What, was they a member of the Church of Christ? If they weren't, you got some serious problems. If Paul is the parent, you need to get in this book. You need to find out before it's everlasting eternity too late. Or in other words, before you die. There may be someone here today that's in need of prayer. For whatever reason, we have a song selected. Let us all be standing as we sing a song of invitation. Won't you come? 681. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thy bidding me come.